It's a pleasure to be here, and, and it's a great, uh, um, well, it's a real opportunity to talk about something that is we've spent quite a long time doing and is uh, dear to our hearts. Um, I, I have to say that there's a lot more to me, a lot more to this than me, you know, so there's a big team of people here, so I'm, I'm representing a lot of other people. The other thing is uh, coming at this from a slightly different point of view than what we've heard this morning, uh, industrial research um, is a is a directed research organisation. So, you know, we come to work in the morning and we sort of do what we're told um, when it gets down to it. But nonetheless, there's a lot of uh, opportunity and freedom within that um, within that. And um, we got onto this superconductivity bandwagon um, at, right at the beginning, back in 1987. So we've been working in the area now for well over 20 years, nearly 25 years as well. So um, it's a long journey, and there's been a um, a lot of questions. So be, being in industrial research, of course, and I'll talk a bit about this, about why you, you do these sorts of things and what, and what the agendas uh, are in that space. The other bit of context here is that um, we got a lot of questions over the years about, you know, why are you doing this? This is something that's, that's global and how can you pe compete with the big teams that are overseas that are doing this stuff? And, and they really were big teams. I mean, just one story is that um, this uh, company I'll talk about a bit, American Superinductor, who we've partnered with, we've been partnered with them since 1992, um, had a contract with the US Navy to build a, um, a superinducting motor. The contract was for $60 million. Um, they didn't complete it for $60 million. They went back and asked for another 30 odd million dollars. So um, they did finish the motor. So, so the cost of building one motor was, you know, the best part of $100 million. You know, so. That's the sort of scale of uh, research and development that's going on in this area. Um, that motor's now being tested, and whether it'll ever get into a boat or not, I don't know, but uh, it, it's, it's enormous um, resources. So the question is, what can you do in New Zealand? And you can't compete, obviously. So you've got you to get into a position where you can do something useful, um, but both in a, in a research sense, in a scientific and engineering sense, but also in a... Um, in a commercialisation and business sense. So starting with industrial research, it's just uh, worthwhile pointing out um, what industrial research is all about. So really, you know, we've got a mandate here and there's a, there's a requirement from the government who's our, who's our owner, and it's about increasing the contribution of the manufacturing sector to the New Zealand economy. So that's a pretty ambitious goal, to say the least. And when you're doing your research, you've got to think about how you can how you can contribute to these sorts of core purposes in your research programs. So just a bit, little bit more detail. This is sort of getting down to the sort of outcomes that the government expects out of an organisation like industrial research. So it's about increasing economic growth um, by improving the performance of, of New Zealand's in, in manufacturing companies. And also there's an, another thing here, increasing the diversity of New Zealand's manufacturing by transforming products um, and disruptive technology. So as you can see, of course, there's two parts. So this is really around technology pull. It's about helping uh, existing industries, really, and improving their performance and productivity. And there's other parts more about technology push and pushing ideas out there and being innovative. And HTS is, was certainly in that phase of the, um, of, of the outcome. Um, but we're, we're getting more and more into this, where there are existing companies in New Zealand that are looking for products and, um, uh, and want to move ahead. Lots of ways it's, it's a, lo a lot more productive from an R&D point of view to help existing organisations because um, you can do sort of incremental improvements. This is, this is really very, um, very difficult. So how do you approach these sort of things? And I, we didn't start this way at all, of course. This is the things I've sort of learnt, learnt have gone along the journey. The way I like to think about it is in value chain, so this is not unique to me or anything, but it took me quite a long time to understand this, but um, it's value chains is the, is the key thing when you're thinking about economic development, particularly off R&D. So in that context, and I'll talk a bit about value chains, and of course we're keen to keep it in New Zealand, so it's an important part that the value chain can give us. Supporting the value chain, you need an R&D platform, so you need that capability, and preferably uh, you need breadth in the, in the R&D and depth. Um, and that's challenging. That, that means you've got to have scale. But if you can, you want to support multiple value chains. And this is the way to reduce the risk. r and is a risky game. So you need to reduce the risk because the investment in New Zealand 
is modest by international standards and so it's very precious. And then I'll illustrate some of these ideas through HDS, so we'll go through that and a little bit looking about to the future what, what we're hoping to do. So just talking about value chains and um, as I say I'm no expert in any of this but this is sort of my view of, of the world and how I think about it and it's, it's just useful if you're trying to think about how you create economic value off, off R&D. So it's, a, it's very much an IRL view of the world. Um, and of course the value chain is in simple terms it just describes the steps by which a product moves from raw materials to a delivered product. But the, this is the more interesting part. They are actually global, right? They exist right across the globe. And there's, there's value chains that start in New Zealand and they finish in New Zealand, and there are global chains which are a bits in New Zealand. They're almost always um, multi-organisational, and the best ones will include R&D in multiple organisations, and they'll include small and large companies. So if you want to create this economic value it, within these value chains, you need to be able to do these complex things. And value chains, you know, there's nodes in them and there's often multiple value chains going through those nodes. So they can, they can be complex. The nice thing about them is that they do uh, get you to focus on the value because it is all about the value, the value at each step, how that, how that increments and how that goes through the chain. So it gets you to think about competitive advantage and the value proposition of whatever you're trying to do. And if you, if you don't understand these things, you won't survive in the value chain. You, you won't survive at all. The other thing from a New Zealand point of view, this thing about added value here uh, from a New Zealand point of view, working on what's, what New Zealand can do, what New Zealand needs to own, and what New Zealand needs to control in parts of the value, parts of the value chain. Because they're global and our limited resources, we're not going to do everything from, from the raw materials through to the completed um, device generally, but we can, we can be part of the key elements of value chains. And of course they do optimise resource allocation if you want to get something through a value chain, you put the resources where it will have the most benefit, where it will create the most, um, the most value. This is a bit more of a New Zealand point of view. Thinking about how you secure the high value steps in a value chain and also making it sticky to New Zealand. So this was important to us in IRL. How can you do this stuff which is international, which is highly competitive, and other people have got a lot of resources, how can you do something that stays in New Zealand? Well, the first thing is you need to be extremely strategic. You need to think about the whole chain and you need to think about what you can do that makes some sense. I think you also need to think about the companies. Preferably you want to grow companies because that's a hell of a lot easier than creating them, but you do need to create them and we've, we've done that as well. But we're now moving more into this, how do you grow these companies? and they've got to be internationally competitive if you want to capture the high value parts in New Zealand. Someone else will do that if you don't. To do that requires a lot of innovation and a, and a substantial part of innovation, particularly in the high value manufacturing, is around R&D. And because these things are, are global, your R&D's got to be internationally competitive. You can't be a, a, a me too. You've, you've really got to be able to foot it with the best people around in the R&D space. Um, if you get some of that right, you can create real economic value, you get high paid jobs. And the nice thing about these value chains is if you can get those key bits and you can capture the key knowledge in them, you can, keep them, you can make them stick in New Zealand. You know? So this was a big criticism we had, how are you going to make this stuff stay in New Zealand? Well it's about the ideas and the innovation and being smart about it and occupying the high value parts of that value chain in New Zealand. And really want to talk about, so this is very much an IRL R&D point of view, you know, you, you, you do want to capture those high value bits. So from a strategic point of view, you want to invest in the companies that are at those high value nodes and you want to invest in your R&D platform and you want to do that strategically and you want to do it at the same time. Um, you, you want the two investments to relate strongly to one another. Just a little bit about R&D platforms because that's sort of where, where I'm coming from and this is what I have responsibility for. So R&D is risky and R&D funds are scarce and so you want to get the best value out of it. But um, that's, that's difficult to do. It takes a long time to know whether you're right or wrong. And we have a lot of debate, uh, particularly with our, our partners uh, in industrial research, about who captures the value. You know, but R&D is really about knowledge, it's about understanding stuff. And if, if a company has a contract with you and pays you to gain that knowledge and the R&D fails, 
you've got the knowledge and they've got nothing, you know. And so that's a huge threat to them. So um, you have a lot, of, a lot of debate about how, how R&D should be paid for and how you get that value. And, and we've put a lot of time thinking about how you can do things with companies but make damn sure that the value, even in a failure, is captured by the company and they get the benefit of that. So they've got to have ongoing access to that know-how, even though the, uh, perhaps the, the research project hasn't delivered what everybody hoped at the beginning of it. Um, in a platform, the management, of, you know, the portfolio management is absolutely critical. You know, so you want to identify the high-value parts. There's no point in, in investing, you know, some millions of dollars in R&D program to generate a few million dollars revenue, right? It, it, it's got to be a few million dollars R&D for tens to hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. Other, it makes no sense. So, you, you want to really understand those high-value outcomes and then invest in them. You know, preferably you want to invest where you get multiple uh, commercial outcomes. Um, across different times. And, and if you do this right, of course, projects will fail or be disappointing or not very successful. You've got others to take their place. You can still get the value, the value out of it. This is the hard part. It's really hard stopping research projects. It's someone's invested in it. It's, they're emotional about it. If it and um, if it's a dog, it's got to go. And um, it's really hard, um, a really hard question. It's a really hard conversation to have when you're closing down projects. But in, in a value chain, it becomes very clear often that it's of no value. You're just not going to get that economic value off it. Um, and if everyone understands that, it makes that conversation um, an awful uh, lot easier. And within a platform, of course, you've got, always got other stuff um, to go along with it. So a functioning, what I call a, a fully functioning R&D plat platform, has got a number of characteristics. And I like to think of it in terms that it embraces your companies as well as the R&D. So the companies we're more are going to be very focused on product development and the R&D that, that immediately is supporting that product development. In the R&D organisation, you've got to be thinking more about that medium to longer term outcomes and the knowledge and the, um, and the technology that you're developing, which you can feed into this product development in the R&D and space. The R&D platform and the business objectives, or the objectives of the R&D and the business objectives need to be strongly integrated and highly aligned, um, and you need to have this international part. And in New Zealand that's hard because you, you've got to do a lot of travelling, and um, but it's absolutely essential that you know what's going on internationally as well as, uh, as, well as national. Uh, and the knowledge and the business is, um, is both national and uh, international. So just to sort of illustrate some of this about how we've gone about it, and as I say, this is a view looking back, it's not how we started, we didn't plan this. Uh, stuff because uh, we, we just had no idea that this was uh, was important. But when you look back, you can sort of see the pattern that was um, that, that was evolving. We did go from material science through to um, systems, and we started off um, developing and, and discovering uh, materials uh, right back in eighty seven, eighty eight, and we we, we developed quite a large patent portfolio of uh, mainly composition of matter patents but also processing uh, <coughs> patents for superconducting wire as well. These were relatively complex materials so I guess that sort of helped. There was, there was lots of opportunity and there were new, new, uh, new materials so lots of opportunities for IP and we were, we were lucky enough in fact to um, identify first that one of the key technologically key materials um, and were able to license that. Nonetheless because of the complexity of making a wire out of these um, materials it took more than 10 years before commercial wire became available. So these are the sort of time frames. If you're thinking about building a superconducting machine and it takes you 10 years just to make the wire, and then God knows how many years it takes you to understand how to use the wire and make a machine, it's a substantial um, journey. And, and that really was around the complexity of, of making a wire out of this material, a brittle ceramic. In 2004, we spun off this company, HGS 110, which started off making coils and current leads but over the years has developed into um, building much more sophisticated magnets. Uh, this magnet is one example here where they're doing, um, it goes into the hard disk industry for testing hard disks, so um, it's a high field 5 Tesla uh, magnet. 2007 we, we formed a joint venture with General Cable called General Cable Superinductors. So this was a mult with a multinational and I'll talk a bit about why we, why we did that. Um, and that was, that was uh, set up 
to uh, manufacture what we call winding cables. So this is the sort of cable that goes into ge large utility generators and transformers, uh, very large machines in the, uh, in the power sector. Uh, last year, Scott Technology, which is a listed New Zealand company, which is pretty well known to most of you, I'm sure, uh, then invested in HDS 110. So we, we finally had a, um, a, a reliable source of capital, which was critical for those development, because they were getting to the point where they needed now to grow substantially. Having, having learned how to wind coils and use this complicated material to make a magnet, the, the real game is now is really only just beginning. And this sort of base then, and particularly with general cable superconductors, allows us to uh, think about developing systems for the power sector where there's in principle a huge market um, there. The research platform that we've developed over the years has, has I guess these sorts of characteristics. You know, so the great thing about superconductivity is it's hard to imagine almost anything where you can't use it and it couldn't add technical value. It's another matter of whether it'll add any commercial value. That's a, something you could debate for quite a while. But technically, you know, it, it's it's sort of some, the nearest you can get for something for nothing, right? You can pass a current through a wire loop and you don't see any dissipation. So it's a, it's an amazing sort of phenomena. So, and you can apply it an enormous range of things. So people have built transmission cables out of it. There's a, a number of projects now around the world going in uh, and, and still going in. Um, the longest, so they're not very large projects, but um, there's one in Long Island. It's a little bit more than half a kilometre long. It's a 300 and, I forget, 350 uh, MVA uh, transmission cable project. It's a, it's a high voltage transmission system. So uh, these things can be really made to work in electric systems. We're not doing that. That's beyond us uh, and the sort of resources we have. The other area you can use it as an electronic device. So there are companies building uh, filters and other, other devices for cell phone base stations. I think five or seven thousand installations in the United States using super H HDS high temperature superconducting devices. Uh, in cell phone base stations. So there's another whole business there which, which we're not involved in. We, we said we're going to work with uh, wire and, and coils and think about building machines um, with wire, wires and coils. So we've got this, develop, this knowledge off the materials and the wire and, and just getting more and more sophisticated as time went on. Um, we've also got a, a, a development program, cryogenic refrigeration. That's down here in, in Christchurch actually. Uh, working with Canterbury University uh, in lots of ways. That's a, a very innovative uh, program. There's some very innovative engineers working in that area and they're getting huge international attention now. And, and the real opportunity there is that the sort of cryogenic refrigerators that a lot of you are probably familiar with, you use in a laboratory, are just completely unsuitable for going into a switchyard, right? Where you need uh, something that uh, uh, has very little maintenance and will last for a long time. Where the sort of refrigerators we have in laboratories that have got a high, high maintenance and we tend to turn them off uh, often. So uh, there's a real opportunity for building robust, um, efficient uh, refrigerators. And of course, then try, learning about integrating these things together to build magnets. So this is a, an example of a, um, a magnet which is going into the uh, synchrotron beam at Brookhaven National Lab. And, and here are the uh, cryostats with the HTS. Brookhaven spends a million dollars a year on power and um, just using these superconducting coils as opposed to copper, they can uh, chop out a huge chunk of that million dollars off their power bill. In addition to that, these are much smaller, these superconducting coils, so they, they've got better beam optics and um, they can do more things with their magnets than they are able to, um, able to do with copper. So those are sort of value propositions that, uh, that you can offer. So HDS-110 is doing this here really and they're building industrial magnets and selling them to uh, scientific industrial magnets to a range of uh, companies and organisations around the world and more recently getting into more sophisticated magnets. So they've sold one or two NMR magnets and we're just developing a, an MRI magnet. We just got that going before Christmas, one and a half Tesla MRI uh, magnet. And this sort of capability here can underpin things going to electric, electricity systems because things like generators and transformers at the end of the day build on a lot of the um, capability that you've got in this space here. You can't do this on your own. I think um, Keith said that as well, and, and it's absolutely true. You know, so we, we had this ongoing debate about partnering, who do you partner with, and, and how you go about that, and do you partner with big companies, small companies, and all that sort of stuff. We, we started our own company up, HTS 110, because nobody wanted to partner with us back in the, the early 2000s. They just didn't 
understand and they didn't, uh, I guess, trust the, that there was a market here for this. So we had to sort of do that and get it started. But I can tell you it was an awful lot easier working with existing companies than starting one uh, from scratch. Um, there's no doubt about that. But there are things that you just simply can't do. So we did all this material science, we dealt with a lot of IP, um, and the first thing you need to do with all that, of course, make superconducting wire. And that was just completely beyond New Zealand. Um, we licensed that to American Superconductor in 1992, and they've raised hundreds of millions of dollars on the NASDAQ and with, through government grants and things like that uh, to make superconducting wire. And in fact, they've ended up making uh, two technologies. Um, the, the world went, started off with one technology, which they licensed from us, and in more recent years, over the last sort of 10 years, uh, there's a second generation uh, material coming on. So this has required a huge investment just to make wire which is uh, capable of going reliably into, into machines. We, d we did have a, a, beyond the licensing agreement, we had a research partnership and that's been, from a strategic point of view, really critical because it gave us enormous insight into, into wire and warts and all, but it also gave us a link into an international organisation that was uh, really trying to um, spearhead this whole technology drive. So we got sort of dragged along a little bit in understanding uh, how you go about this stuff and understanding uh, value chains and thinking about our, our place in that, in, in those value chains. So you don't need to occupy the whole thing, but you need to think about the bits that you can do and the bits that are the high value. So these are the bits we could do. We could do these components and we could do those really well and HS 110 is clearly a leader in that, in that area. And the model there is Oxford Instruments. I mean, they're a successful, or we're, we're a successful uh, UK-based company in the area of superconducting magnets, and that's a, it's not a, a bad model for what, so what we're trying to do in this, in this area. As I said before, we're developing these much more sophisticated magnets here. These are much harder to do than just straight scientific magnets. And then the winding cable, um, it will empower uh, power, uh, uh, HTS going into power systems. The thing about um, superconductivity, of course, is in the world. The world is AC, right? There's alternating currents everywhere. Superconductors are no longer zero resistance uh, when you've got alternating currents. There's now dissipation. And if you've got dissipation in a cryogenic envelope, that's, that's expensive in terms of energy to keep that um, device cold. But there are ways of engineering conductors so you can reduce those losses a lot. And this winding cable allows us to, to it's, it's an engineered cable, to reduce those, um, those alternating current losses. So it will enable HTS going to power systems, which opens up then this absolutely enormous uh, market. So we're partnering with General Cable, the local company here in Christchurch, so that has been great, but of course they are backed up by this great, um, by this multinational, and that has allowed us then to have access to other multinationals and, um, and to their value chains. So that's a, that's a really uh, important um, part of the whole thing. If you need to talk to these multinationals in this area, and if we roll up as a research lab for New Zealand, they're sort of polite to you, but that's about all, you know. Um, but when you are part of a, uh, a multinational, like General um, Cable, it um, is a much more compelling conversation that you have, and um, it's, it's been really valuable and has accelerated a whole lot of things. So we've got a, um, a non-developing relationship with Siemens, for instance, but having General Cable alongside us has made that a, um, a pretty important uh, relationship and is driving it, you know. And because of this, we can then contribute to um, the development of electric power systems. So this is uh, giving a little bit of insight into what this so-called value chain in New Zealand looks like. In wire development, I guess IRL is the, uh, the specialty organisation there. And it's fundamental to everything, of course, that you understand the wire, its complexity, and you can characterise it. And that performance is really important because that then feeds in to all the design work that the engineers need to do uh, later on. HGS 110 is the lead in electromagnetic design, so they're designing magnets and um, components for power systems, um, rotor coils and things like that. Um, there's quite a lot of manufacturing around winding coils and assembling a magnet, they're quite complex things. Uh, integrating with um, the cryogenic part of it, being able to fabricate um, cryogenic systems, both metallic and non-metallic, and this is where Fabrin Solutions, a small Christchurch company, is working with the small, highly specialised companies is just so important because they're so adaptable, so flexible and so ready to learn. Um, and, and if you write out purchase orders for them, um, it, it's, there really, really is a great sort of relationship there. 
cryogenic refrigeration, we've been developing this, but HS1 and, and particularly Scott are now, now starting to commercialise that. And there's a market there beyond just HDS. I mean, there's uh, liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen is needed in a whole wide range of industries and medical industries, um, artificial insemination, you name it, particularly in remote areas and things like that. So there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity there. Then subcomponents we've brought in people like um, Buckley Systems, a whole lot of engineering companies throughout New Zealand are, are contributing um, to all, all of these sorts of developments here as well. The AC loss development that we're doing at General Cable, and the manufacturing of course has brought in a lot of companies. DC Ross in Dunedin, Whitehall Technical Services on the epoxies and things up in Auckland. There's a lot of expertise in New Zealand companies that you can bring in to help you with your technology development and, and they're always willing to, um, to do that. And then building more complex systems, so we've got this project building a transformer and there the number of people who want to join and be part of it is almost overwhelming. So there's this uh, ETEL, this distribution company, uh, dis distribution transformer company up in Auckland owned by Unison, which is a power a distribution company. Uh, Hawke's Bay and the Bay of Plenty are keen. Vector are going to host the transform, I hope. BB Power Christchurch Company in project development and power systems, really bringing a lot of value um, to that project. So it's a, a real New Zealand multi-organisational project, which is really quite, uh, quite exciting. Human capital is, is critical. We, you know, we need really good, dedicated people and um, and we're getting them, we're getting people now from uh, New Zealand universities but also from overseas. Um, a lot of recent hires have come from overseas including overseas companies as well. So we've got um, three people now from Siemens, um, two, from Ger uh, two from the UK and one from Germany uh, working there. So people that have spent you know, the last five, eight years building MRI systems for Siemens are now working on our MRI system. So you, you start to bring in this capability, you know, you feel like you can take on a lot of stuff um, that way. Internationally is, is really important working internationally. So we've been working with the wire manufacturers, American Superconductor, we've had a 20 year research contract with them and more recently with Superpower also in the United States and Fujikura in, um, in Japan. Fantastic learning working with these guys, General Cable I've talked about. Uh, Wilson Transformers, an Australian company that builds big power transformers, are part of the transformer program. And on the refrigeration area, work with um, Cryomec, which is a US-based company that makes laboratory cryogenic refrigerators. Some of you may have some of their refrigerators in your lab. Air Liquide, of course, is a big gas company in the, um, in the refrigeration space, have uh, using some of our refrigerators and trialling them. Um, and Absolute uh, Systems is a... Um, a cryogenic consulting company also out of France, interestingly enough as well. So they have been helping us with things like the cryogenic system for the transformer, which actually is the most complicated things in building a superconducting transformer actually is a, is a cryogenic system. The superconducting part is reasonably straightforward. And innovation with customers is critical, and we, we heard that this morning as well, you know, so all the things that Keith was doing, you know, you've got to do exactly the same things whatever you're doing. So. Magnets, there's been a lot of work done with uh, national laboratories uh, in the United States and in Germany, um, India, uh, building magnets for their need but doing it alongside them, plus uh, NMR um, providers of one sort. We've done contracts with companies that have got uh, contracts on the US Air Force building, building generators. Kawasaki in Japan, uh, HS110 supplied them with rotor components and universities like Tokyo University Marine Science, or University of Marine Science, um, university, r really innovative people that are, that are critical in, in building up your knowledge of these things. Uh, winding cables, once again working with the national labs uh, in the US are great places to work on new stuff and try and develop your ideas. So you know, the, uh, National High Magnetic Field Lab, Fermi Lab and Lawrence um, Berkeley and Siemens, of course, we've got a, a relationship they've been buying cable from us for development and going into their generators and other companies in the uh, cryogenic refrigeration space. So you, you've got to put this chain together and you've got to be, try and be part of this emerging value chain and thinking about all the parts of it and doing it strategically, thinking about the bits that you can be good at and the bits that you can help other people with uh, and work with those. Um, it's, once again, just to, you know, Keith was absolutely on the on, nail on the head, you know, it's about relationships and about forming those partnerships um, is, is a key part of the whole thing. This is just a bit about the Siemens generator. So it, this is a conventional generator around, um, 
I think the target is around 150 um, MVA. It's a copper iron machine. It has a copper uh, based uh, rotor in the middle. This part here is the, uh, the stator. And um, you take that out and uh, it's replaced with a superconducting um, rotor. Um, and of course you need a refrigerator um, attached to that as well. And you gain quite a lot. You gain a little bit of in, in energy efficiency, but the inductance of the HTS uh, rotor is lower, so this machine can respond to changes in loads much more quickly than a copper iron machine can. And it's these sorts of systems that power engineers uh, like in the value proposition. So you've got a machine which is much more adaptable to rapidly changing loads. So those are the sort of things that are around the, uh, the value, value proposition. So what are we doing next? We're the NMR, these more sophisticated magnets need to be completed and, and finished off. Um, and we just just got this one and a half Tesla MRI magnet up and running just before Christmas, so that was a real uh, milestone. This was done with the second generation wire, so that was a second um, uh, goal in that in that program, and, and we've successfully um, done that. But these systems require a lot of additional components, which we were, we were looking for. And it would be nice to get as much as this from New Zealand as you possibly can. But in the end, if you want to sell one of these more sophisticated magnets, there's a lot more to it than a magnet. You know, you've got to have all these electronic components, spectrometers, and, and particularly software and so on. So you need to be able to access all of that stuff if you want a product that's going to be acceptable in the, uh, in the marketplace. And of course, we need uh, industrial partners in the getting to market and, uh, and in supporting the product in the market. The power systems is... is you know, at one level, it's sort of mad, really. I mean, it's uh, it, it really is stepping up an enormous amount, and I it, it still remains to be seen whether we really can um, foot it. It's something that the big players like Siemens and people um, are doing, but we've got this huge capability now, and I think we can contribute to this this uh, area. Commercially, we've really got to work out what our role is in this uh, in this area, but it is an opportunity, and we are being taken seriously by companies like Siemens and Convertim in the UK, for instance. So. You know, they are looking for us to supply components and, and know-how. So it's small in some sense, but it's, it's a start. And so the, the challenge is going to be to really grow those commercial opportunities off the, uh, off the base that we have here. Just to finish up then, uh, coming back to the first point, I mean, it is really challenging in New Zealand to do economic development off R&D. I don't think there's any uh, question about that. But I think if you are strategic in your thinking, you are flexible and you, you can get a long-term commitment to what you're doing, uh, it can be done, but you do need these other character characterizations. Partnerships are, are important and, the, and thinking about the value change, thinking about the whole thing, because these are complex systems which have got to be put together and no one organization can do it. You need high R&D intensity, it's got to be internationally competitive because you just won't be taken seriously if you can't do that. And you need to be very flexible and multidisciplined because um, there's a lot of skills required in putting together a technology and delivering a machine. You need big and small companies to contribute. Uh, they all have their role. And international partnering and understanding international markets and, uh, and international technology and technology trends is really um, critical to be, just so you know what, what is going on, otherwise you'll be uh, completely um, blindsided. But I think in the HTS area, we've ended up doing some of this stuff more by accident than plan, I have to say. But um, parts of it are looking really good in terms of magnets, uh, scientific industrial magnets, and other parts of it are still an unknown, a question mark, but are a big opportunity if we can get the resources to, um, to do it. Thanks very much.